In the year 1997, the future is in chaos and turmoil. Mankind is on the brink of extinction. Brave survivors band together and build a time displacement apparatus to receive a signal from a parallel future. This transmission is the Boondicott. Welcome to the Wundercast and to an episode of Midnight Movie Matinee. I'm really not sure if I'm going to keep on doing like Midnight Movie ma- and just call it the Wundercast the entire time. Yeah. I don't know. I can't yeah. decide. I think we have too many, too many titles. You got to like consolidate yourself. We're not Kevin Smith yet. No. Because the reason why he has like different episodes is because he does it with different people, but we just keep doing them with each other so what's the point of naming them like 16 different things unless we're gonna start adopting different accents like Wolfson was like welcome to the Wunderkast Guten Tag Guten Tag I am Christine and this is Hans Gruber Hans, I'm Hans Gruber <laughs> yes, Hans Gruber I'm yeah. dead you're having a podcast with a dead man oh my god I'm being haunted my god <laughs> my god by the spirit <laughs> Yeah, you know, whatever, like, famous German. That'd be cool if there was, like, a Ouija board podcast that only, like, talked <laughs> to dead villains <laughs> from movies. <laughs> like, we're going to talk to Scar and figure out... <laughs> Do our best Jeremy Irons impression. <laughs> Mm. <laughs> yeah, I can't even do it. He's way too pee, British. Pee, and pee, and pee. That's all <laughs> He's got. way too British and crazy for me. So you already transitioned us nicely into the topic of this week's show, <laughs> uh, which is podcasting, which is Kevin Smith, which is his new uh, film that was released on 600 theaters and seen by 600 people. <laughs> Perhaps less. <laughs> Perhaps less. <laughs> but the proud 600. Uh, Tusk, the walrus movie, a.k.a. Uh, yeah, I, AKA myself. A.k.a. the walrus movie? Yeah, a.k.a. the movie about a walrus. Yeah. I mean, how often do you get movies about walruses? Not a.k.a. Often. The, jo- the, the joke, the podcast joke turned film. Oh, we're going to get into that. I have a full You're breakdown the trolling. so that we can tell the full story of what's going on. Let me turn off the TV because it's kind of distracting. Yeah, we have a TV on. And it's showing some preview for some, like, Showtime show, I think? No, it's that Heaven is Real show where the kid the swears he saw Heaven when he died and then all these people were like, your son is the gift from the prophets. And it's just so- you saw Grandpa? Whoa! Oh my gosh, what was Heaven like? It was kind of like the Piggly Wiggly. <laughs> <laughs> They never ran out of Dr. Pepper. <laughs> the juice was extra cold. It was extra cold and there was popsicles. And Grandpa didn't need his wheelchair. Heaven is real. That's my business. My <laughs> 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 uh, isolated our redneck uh, audience. Sorry, yeah, all guys. our Georgian listeners are just like, what? <laughs> I was listening to Stone Cold Steve Austin's podcast. He's mm-hmm. a, a wrestler. I don't know if you know who he is. Yes, I know who Stone Cold Steve Austin okay. is. But he spent the whole podcast just talking about this Ingalls grocery in Georgia and how it's the greatest grocery he's ever been to in his <laughs> life and how they have the most delicious rotisserie chicken. <laughs> but it was just crazy to hear some like oh, badass man. guy just talking about rotisserie chicken for what? an hour. Our love of rotisserie chicken in America. I mean, if, if a grocery store doesn't have a rotisserie and doesn't rotisserie its own chicken. It's not a grocery store. Like, every grocery store I know at this moment has a rotisserie. All Publix has got to have a rotisserie. Costco's got to have a rotisserie. I'm sure BJ's mm-hmm. has a rotisserie. I mean, there's no way. You can't be a legitimate grocery store 
without a friggin' rotisserie, even if it's just like a fucking one of the one of those one of those. But then why did Kenny Rogers <laughs> Roasters die? Ah, uh, well, I don't actually know that story. That sounds. That's the story for another podcast. Because the, the Boston Market was a competition, can't mm-hmm. compete with Boston Market. By the way, what the fuck does Boston have to do with rotisserie chicken? Was it is that a in Turkey? I don't know. What does it have to do with chicken? America? (laughs) It's like, isn't it like Thanksgiving all the time at Boston Market? Isn't that It's Thanksgiving all the time in Boston? In Boston, it's Thanksgiving all the time. Yeah, because they have, they impersonate Indians and throw tea off of boats. So they always have Indians for Thanksgiving all year long. (laughs) Bostonians, give us your thoughts. Why do they call it Boston Market? Okay, we derailed this podcast. You derailed it. You derailed it. You derailed it. I th- Tusk. Tweet us at Vundablog who derailed it. <laughs> who derailed the podcast? <laughs> On Twitter, in case you don't know what Twitter is. What? When you tweet which us. Which one of our audience would I don't know. know maybe Twitter someone's is. just like, what's a tweet? What's a Twitter? And they need to know that Twitter goes a tweet because it's Those not Those are probably Twitter. the same people that just got offended by us making fun of Heaven is Real and the Piggly Wiggly. Oh. So they tuned out. So they, they don't know. Oh. <laughs> They're the only ones. Okay. So about a year plus ago, I was hanging out, listening to podcasts, and what should come across, come across, come across my podcast listening ears, but Smodcast 259, The Warriors and the Carpenter, I was there when it first dropped, and I heard the movie before I saw the movie, and the original pitch that would become this film, Tusk, um, and I immediately tweeted Warriors, yes. Uh, and I did not believe him when they said they were going to make a movie about a man who was You remember that? Yes, I do remember that. I don't know. Just I might, told I might have just bleed it into the. a year ago. We're not senile. Like it's not. <laughs> We're not living oceanic voyages we at don't sea. Have short-term memory loss. <laughs> okay, but I had told everyone about this pitch for a movie because it's just a great conversation piece. To be like, what would happen if you go to someone makes you a strange offer to live in their house rent free. But you have to dress as a walrus for two hours a day in a walrus spoo suit, speaking in a walrus voice, and then catching fish and crabs with your mouth. Would you or would you do that? It's a beautiful query to pose to all your really? friends. It's beautiful. Yeah, it's like a drunken little game you it's could play. It's a drunken game, all right. I mean, that's, that's high. See how depraved. That stoner conversation is his height. It's like, what if a walrus man was like a dude, man? <laughs> <laughs> what if man but was was but a walrus at heart? <laughs> so that's how this film was made. In Kevin Smith's uh, stoner stupor, he wrote this movie based on this uh, Gumtree ad that turned out to be a hoax. Um, he found oh uh, funding for it. He released it. He was going to originally release it like he did Red State, which is just he's going to tour gonna it himself. OG. No, he's gonna tour it himself mm-hmm. for like the first like six, like the first half a year, mm-hmm. probably, mm-hmm. maybe like eight months, and make probably like six million dollars with it, like he did on Red State. I think he made like five, six million dollars mm-hmm. just touring Red State like that. Um, and then he was gonna release it on VOD, and then on DVD, obviously. Maybe he should have done that. He might have should have done that, but I think that the appeal of him just to get a wide out. release again. Yeah, even nice. if it was a limited wide release, was like you know a nice little. I wonder how that happened. Do you know the secret? Uh, well, A twenty four, which is the film company that put it out, put out Spring Breakers. Oh, okay. And they had they've had they've been having success recently with their small little acquisitions and putting them out like so, this. Oh God, I guess so. They uh, they rolled the dice on Tusk. That makes sense that the company that made James Franco a wannabe like black guy with gold teeth and cornrows. Were responsible for releasing this movie because that's pretty much the most. That's thing. a responsible company. <laughs> that's that's the most far out thing I ever wanted to see was James Franco like, yeah, doing his worst southern southern draw. southern rap drawl. Watched way too many like ludicrous videos to try to get that in his face. Ugh, Ugh God. Okay. Do you? Uh, what? I have a. I've had a long tumultuous, not tumultuous, but. A long history of 
loving Kevin Smith. I, uh, my, uh... You can say it's tumultuous. Has it ever been tumultuous? Well, around the time of Jersey Girl, it was hard to, like, be like, I like Kevin Smith a lot! (laughs) Because everyone's like, really? The guy that just sold out? (laughs) The guy who, like, stopped being indie? Cop out. I saw a cop out in theaters. I yes, you told me. And but that's also a hard time to love. I like the Sean William Scott part to that movie. They still work. <laughs> Just everything. Is Sean William said. Scott alive? Is did he die? No, he's alive. He's oh, fine. He's well, doing really good. I don't know good. why. I th- oh, you know why? Because he and Paul Walker, they kind of seem like the same person to me. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, white people bleed together. <laughs> it's not racism. It's two, just two whiteness. Two blonde whiteies. I, but do you see my point? Like I could see that, but I think... <laughs> a, no I no heard, disrespect to the poor I late haven't heard from Paul Walker. I have heard from such a long time, but I was like, did he die? Is no he disrespect okay? to Paul Walker, but yeah. Sean William Scott's way more talented than Paul Walker. I yes, feel. he actually is. That's the funny part, is that he is... Like, seriously, I feel bad for Paul Walker. He's dead, and he shouldn't have died, and it really sucked. But I always kind of love to watch people try to, like, gloss over their, like... He was a mediocre actor. He found his niche. He did his thing. He got by but on his he looks. He got by on his looks. had a couple good and breaks, And he was a know? nice guy, and he got by on, like, doing... He did, basically, his major career was doing these movies about driving fast cars. That was pretty much it. Yeah. And then when he died, they released that last movie of his. It You know how sometimes... Brick Mansions, I believe it's called. Sometimes it feels like somebody died on purpose, and that sounds awful, but it almost feels like someone died on purpose because, like, the last movie they released is, like, a masterpiece or something. Like, <laughs> Ledger left us on The Joker. You know, I mean, well, he did start the Imaginary Dr. Parnassus, which was still actually a pretty cool movie, but whatever. But, like, his hi- right around the time he died it was like they released the Joker it was almost like he's like I'm done I'm never gonna reach this height again <sighs> time to fade to black you know what I mean but like with Paul Walker it was just like more of the same <laughs> mediocre films it's like this like we're gonna do another crime movie this was it for Paul Walker man this was this was the tippy top of the ladder he went out on top <laughs> he went out the way he came in <laughs> pretty much just kind of skating on it <laughs> oh man, I'm going to hell. But I mean it though. It's the tr- I mean, it's the truth. As an actor, we cannot say that he is on some. Le- we I could never say one day Paul Walker's going to do something that's going to get him that Oscar nod. I don't think I could ever. There say was that. that one movie. I want to say that it's called Running with Scissors. Sc- run no, not Running with Scissors. Running Scared. I want to say it's called Running Scared, but I know there's another movie called Running Scared. It's a Paul Walker movie? It's a Paul Walker movie that everyone thought that that was, like, his definitive Paul Walker performance, and I saw it, and I was just like, what's the big deal about this? Uh, what is it? It was, like, a n- noir sort of film. It was a noir film. Yeah. Um, I have to find We're this We're checking on the wonderful site, IMDb. Hours, Pawn Shop Chronicles, Vehicle 19, I, Death and Life of Bobby Z. Running scared. Running scared. It was running scared. There we that go. Was, that ding, was ding, 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 ding. Right after he did Into the Blue. <laughs> I'm sorry. No, Paul, let's get away from Paul Walker's film career, please. So, like I was saying, I love Kevin Smith. I'll preface this podcast by saying this. Listen to all his podcasts. I've. Uh, I remember my brother coming home from seeing a movie called Dogma in theaters and. Uh, being very interested by his description of it and wanting to see it, and then probably about a year later watching it on video and I think then Dog having was to. Most underrated film. He really? I do. I think. I think it gets its credit. No, I don't. I don't think it does. I think a lot of people kind of write it off. I find. I think it's one of his more underrated movies. I think it's one of his, at least like top three, mm-hmm. best movies that he's made. Sometimes though, I just can't get past the. I know it's his stickiness with the Jay and Silent Bob, but sometimes I can't get past the that. I kind of feel like it's it's the sort of mask that he's putting on so that he doesn't have to be vulnerable. When he, I feel like Jay and Silent Bob are his cover for like his sort beard, of, so that yeah, he doesn't have to be honest. So he doesn't have to be honest because every time he, he really starts 
sticking it in. It's like if with Jane Saw and Bob there, they can always make a dick joke, and then it's like... I think it's just, uh, you know, with a spoonful of sugar, and he likes to add extra sugar on his That's spoon. Is that a sugar? Is is that a spoonful of sugar or a spoonful of jizz I never asked for? Hey, <laughs> you say tomato, I say jizz. I'm not saying I don't. I there are you know I there are parts where I really like Jane Silent and Bob on some level, but sometimes I find them distracting to other parts of his work, which is why I kind of like best use of Jane Silent and Bob in a movie. Their movie and Silent Bob <laughs> Strike Back. Strike no, back. yeah, you think best no. use of Jane Silent Bob is chasing Amy. Yeah, you think one scene, freaking. Jay has a couple moments, and then Silent Bob has, like, this long-ass monologue. It's awesome. I kind of liked him in Mall Rats because I like the sequence where Silent Bob uses the Force. I think that was pretty cool. That was a great moment. I think that was See, a See, they... Kevin Smith has created a wonderful uh, film catalog with, look at all these rich moments that he's stolen <laughs> from other movies <laughs> and put in his films, but it's fun, you know? It's like a nice little mixtape of movie the moments he's collected. The thing about Kevin Smith is I feel that what I like about him as a filmmaker is that you see what you get, like, from him. You know what I mean? Like, it's not... He does put himself into every movie he makes. And whether it's the way he writes dialogue or the way he does the movie, he puts himself into everything he makes. So I think that as an auteur, he's successful that way because you know it's a Kevin Smith movie. You know? And I think, actually, that's why, you know, when they do things like Cop Out and Jersey Girl... I call them like his sellouts because they don't feel like Kevin Smith movies you know and they don't feel like he put himself in them so when you look at the body of his work those movies feel disingenuous to who he is and I think he's even admitted that those were movies weren't really to the best of his ability they weren't the most genuine part movies he's ever made for himself yeah I was having to like fabricate even Red State I find far more genuine I, when I see Red State, I'm like, oh, yeah, this is a Kevin Smith movie. I see this. You know, I see parts of Kevin Smith in Red State and Tusk. Definitely huge parts of Kevin Smith in Tusk. So I think that as an auteur, I think he's had success. He Obviously, he's had some falters because, you know, like... But even... I loved... Like, some people don't like Zack and Mary, and I actually really love that movie. It's, like, one of my favorite movies of his, actually. Zach yeah, a lot of people... Part. A lot of people tout that among their favorites. Um, not me. I don't know. But... I like it. I think it works. Um, what What's the first time you heard of a uh, Kevin Smith movie? What's the first time I've heard of a Kevin Smith movie? Oh, God. Or is it just always there? He's just always kind of been mm. there. What is the first? I really can't even think about the Because I remember Kevin Smith that movie. since my brother said that he had, like, dogma, mm -hmm. I did some research. I think dogma was my first really knowing Kevin Smith. Yeah? Yeah. I had done some research, so for Christmas, I very thoughtfully got my parents to give him Clerks and Chasing Amy and a copy of Dogma. So that you could watch them. So that I could watch them and then <laughs> keep them. Selfish mother. For myself. <laughs> <laughs> but it all worked out in the end. But anyway, let's, let's move off of oh, General off Kevin Smith history. Okay, spoiler free. Revenge. Thoughts on Tusk? Would you recommend it? I actually would. I think that I think you need to understand the concept before you go in, so that you you either, as every review has said, which is quite honest and true. If you don't get it, if you don't get it, like if you don't understand what this is, you are going to despise this movie. You're going to be like, why the hell did anyone waste time and effort and money on this? <laughs> Um, but you have to go in understanding what this is. This is, I think, I, and this is one of those movies where the history, maybe that's one of the reasons why it didn't do as well, because knowing the history of the the movie and why it was made helps you appreciate it more. Knowing that yeah, it was the, based on a podcast and it's basically a giant troll. And it's not <laughs> a giant troll, it's, it's actually I, I, it's kind a, of a giant, giant troll. It's a giant Easter egg. It's just full of Easter eggs from all of his podcasts crammed into one movie yeah. it's a fan film for his uber fans in a way it's sort of like micro like you're 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 so for so you're appealing for his, to so for his fans a micro base it's of a, fans exactly so for his fans it's for it's his micro base of fans but for everybody else it's basically a giant troll 
it's like... Is that how it comes across? I don't know. Maybe a little bit. But... Or it comes across as a crazy person (laughs) (laughs) was given money and this is how he spent it. How I spent my summer vacation. I created a suit of walrus. A suit of walrus. Anyway, yeah, so... I think, I, but I think you have to understand the concept going in. I think it'd be a good idea to read a little bit of background about this movie, and I, I, I think it definitely has. I don't know. I liked it. I really did. I liked the movie. It's not perfect. I think it's uneven. It needs better editing. Sorry, Kevin Smith. I know you edited this movie yourself, but I don't think you should have done that. <laughs> like I think it needed editing, um, better. Uh, just sometimes pacing was really uneven you know like there were scenes that all of a sudden were, there were things were moving and then all of a sudden we stop and we go to this other scene and you're like why is the scene here at this part of the movie like this could have either been over here or not here at all i would never have missed this moment um so i at that i do think it suffers from however positives i think it's beautifully shot um i think it was really gorgeously filmed especially the way they reveal the effects that they use and yes. stuff like that. It's really... I think that creates a sense of dread. There are really are creepy moments in this movie. It's not just, like, funny. Like, ha ha ha, oh my god, how gross. It there, The beginning, before we really get into, like, you know, seeing the full walrus, <laughs> you... <laughs> Can't help but for... laugh when you think about it, when yeah. you see it. When you go full walrus, then, it's get, then it gets a little jocular, but, like... Up until then, I think the creation of the walrus is creepy. Like, the effects are sort of gross and and implied, so that Mm -hmm. always gives it a sense of, like, ugh. Um, And, I mean, Michael Parks is just so good. He's just so good. Like, I don't understand. That guy's, like, crazy. But he was really good, and he creates the sense of dread that you feel. You know what I mean? So, and, and then he knows also when to switch to that dread to the full walrus. Like, he goes full walrus. It's like when Michael Park goes full walrus, it's like, all right, well, here we are in this moment. Um, but I, yeah, I think I, I do. I think it, I think this showed a side of Kevin Smith that was really ambitious. You know, and funnily enough, through even though this was all basically one giant kind of joke, you know, it it showed an ambitious side to Kevin Smith in terms of writing a movie, making it different, making it interesting the way it was filmed, the way they structured it, and everything like that, and I know that he actually mentioned that he'd gotten some professionalist interest Then the movie came out, even though it didn't do so well in the box office, there were people actually saying, hey, you did a really good fucking job making yeah, this movie. Yeah, Variety like, gave it a great in terms review. Of, in terms of technical aspects, he got a lot of props for the technicality of it, and I think that's great, because I think he is a good movie maker, and I think he is a good director. Um, sometimes I think he gets in his own way, you know, but I think that he, he just, yeah, like I, but I think that he, it's worth having him around and worth having him make more movies and I'm excited to see, and I kind of love the idea of a Canadian horror trilogy. I don't know, we we haven't mentioned it yet, but Stephen said that this is the first of two, of a trilogy. Mm -hmm. There are going to be two other movies all set in Canada and it's going to be Yoga Hosers, which is going to be about the two convenience store girls that we meet in this movie, which are played by Johnny Depp's daughter... Lily Rose. And Kevin Smith's daughter... Harley um, Quinn. Um, they are going to be in sort of like... He's described... Kevin Smith has described it as like... Sort of a Buffy the Vampire Slayer-ish plot. So I think it's going to be like them versus some like ancient Canadian demon. <laughs> and once again, the character of Guy Point will show up, which we'll talk about more. In our spoiler-free spoiler section. No, spoiler-filled section. Spoiler-filled section, sorry. Yeah. Um, I'd recommend the movie to people who have an interest in horror films, um, to 14-year-old boys who want to see fucked up things. Yeah. That's a thing, too. Um, As a horror buff, um, I, this is the thing. When I say horror buff, I know there are people who are oh, horror buff like... They want something scary. I definitely want movies to scare me. I appreciate when movies scare me. But really, when I say at this point in my horror-loving career, I love really good practical effects. Mm -hmm. That's why I love watching even shitty practical effects. I love watching 80s horror movies and creature features because I love practical effects. I love watching 
silicone and latex become something nasty and disgusting. I love watching people's heads coming off and arms ripped off. And I love seeing what they can do with camera tricks and practical effects. So if you're into practical effects, I actually think this is a movie to watch. And this movie isn't like because the concept, gore crazy. It's not. It's not torture porn. That's what I was afraid it was going to be. I was afraid it was going to be this guy torturing Justin Long for two hours to turn him into a walrus while he was awake. You know, having him cut up open on the table, and it's not that at all. It's a lot of that is implied. Justin Long is not awake and constantly being tortured like physically in the movie like that. And But if you're into practical effects, I think just watching how they conceptualize the idea of a man turned into a walrus is pretty fucking ridiculous amazing, yeah. and fascinating. Um, and so I think that if you're into that kind of stuff, you'll enjoy that part of the movie. I think we're ready to make the jump now. To spoiler field. Spoilers, spoilers. These are the spoilers, spoilers. Spoilers. Return of the spoilers song. <laughs> <laughs> okay, spoiler field review. Um, uh, spoilers. Johnny Depp's in this movie. Yes. Spoilers. Sp- he's wearing a prosthetic nose that looks like a penis, like the tip of a penis. The tip of a penis. Look at Courtney's mm-hmm. hair. God, doesn't it make his hair look like the tip of a penis? At Vunderblog, two bonus points if you can tweet us what quote that movie comes from. I'll say it again, just so they can hear it. One's more clearly. Okay, I said, look at Courtney's new haircut. Doesn't it make his head look like the tip of a penis? Come on, tweet it in, guys, come on. Uh, Okay, all around, uh, great, Kevin Smith writes some, like, great monologues. Yeah. For people to deliver the fact that this movie is about podcasters, um, I think really adds this like unique element to the movie. And I'm going to add a critique to the fact that he yes, he wrote some great monologues but this is what I was talking about in terms of editing he wrote them I don't think they should have all been in the movie Yeah um, But I think, you know what? I watched Tusk twice You watched Tusk once Oh, so you're better than me now. No, I'm just saying that <laughs> there's a monologue in the film that is basically like the scene's going on, and then all of a sudden it's cut to close-up shot of Genesis, Genesis Rodriguez, Rodriguez giving this monologue to a person we're not sure of who it is. Turns out it's Teddy, the other podcast host. Played by Haley Joel Osment. Played by Haley Joel Osment of The Sixth Sense. That was the most um, publicity, by the way, that this movie got. Was Haley Joel Was Joel everyone going, what the fuck happened to Haley Joel Osment? Who ate that kid? <laughs> I can say that because I ate myself many years ago. <laughs> so high five, Haley. Hey, I thought he looked adorable. I like He him. looks good. I think he looks cute. He looks good. He's just a little, you know, it's he's a little weird, chub. Though. No, but you don't understand. It's very strange to me because he still looks like himself, but he also looks like a grown-up. So I don't know what to do with him. Like, I look at him, I'm like, this is... It's like they just stretched you. <laughs> it's like they stretched you and gave you facial hair. It's like, you really look the same. So Genesis Rodriguez has this monologue, which when I first saw the movie with you, we were both extremely confused because the monologue is written in a way that the monologue is a it, giant reveal. I don't even think But that, it's confusing. I don't even think that's the... the I think, like I said, this is, an ish, this is the issue I had with the editing. The monologue is cut into the film in such a way that it doesn't feel genuine. When we're watching this monologue for the first couple seconds or a minute, I'm like, is she an actress? Is she like doing like a monologue for acting school? And there's like, somebody uh-huh. watching her that's going to be like, oh, you did such a good job. You did such a good job. And then all of a sudden I'm like, wait, no, this is for real. This is like her genuinely delivering something to this mysterious stranger who I quickly figured out was Haley Joel Osment because duh. And... <laughs> And um and so I don't know I just I know that Kevin Smith probably wanted to give Genesis Rodriguez an, a moment to shine in the film and that's great but just the way that it was cut in and the way that it was shot close up after everything else it felt it felt like an actress delivering a monologue it felt like someone creating a reel it felt like when and... her next audition they're going to be like look at this moment in Tusk you know and instead of feeling like it was part of the story. And in the podcast, he has said that 
that scene wasn't in the original script. Mm-hmm. That he saw how good an actress Genesis was. Mm-hmm. And so on that morning, he wrote her this great monologue to see he, and all her shows. abilities. Yeah. And he fit it into the schedule of the day. And he rushed it. And Unfortunately, that shows. It shows. And it's that, impressive, though. Yeah, but I just... But, but, it, but it takes you out of it. It takes you out of the movie. And that that's why it's like... That's that's my issue. Is it's impressive? I, I think she's a good actress, totally. But it takes you out of the film, and it takes you out of the tone and the pacing completely. Whoop! Like wh- I th- I think that when it comes out on DVD, you should recut the movie and just cut out that scene and see what happens. You know what I mean? I think that mm, yeah. there's gonna be a total. It's gonna be a better movie for it. No offense to Kevin Smith. No offense to Genesis Rodriguez. She did a great job. But oh my god, your dog just farted so yeah, bad. Yeah, no, I've been just thinking about this dog god! fart oh! for the whole length of your speech. It's oh! wonderful. Steven's <coughs> dogs fart. <laughs> it's because you fed her that turkey too. That's exactly what happened yesterday. I gave her that turkey, and she started farting like this the rest of the day. How much turkey did you give her? I give her some. Oh my god, you guys, this dog's fart could clear. A they should do church. a horror movie about my dog's <laughs> farts. <laughs> they should do. There's something wrong with your dog. <laughs> oh my god! And then like she's in a room. It's like a house party and stuff. And the worst part is, and the dog they're... just sombers in, and then the dog farts, and then everyone just starts. <laughs> everyone turns inside over out. No, their skin turns inside out because they're so toxic. You guys, and it's always silent. She doesn't make any noise. It's not like she's like, and you know, it's just this spray that comes out of her anus, and she always sleeps with her fucking ass directly <laughs> towards us. <laughs> She she's guarding you. <laughs> she's on defense. Yeah, she figures if she skunks us that other pe- other predators won't want to eat us. Perhaps. Uh, oh my god. Okay. okay. Did it get better? So Is it better? Speaking of dog fart performances. Whoa. As bad as my dog's farts are is how good Michael Parks' performance <laughs> was. <laughs> See what I did dog. there? Uh Michael Parks who delivers the gold in Several Tarantino movies is how I know him, and he had, you know, was the leading preacher in Red State and delivered a chilling performance as this very cool, cold hearted guy. Um, not cool as in like cool. No, I know like, what you mean. Yeah. Okay, Ice cold. Good. He's not Fonzie. He's not Ice like. Cold. He's not like, hey, I hate fags. <laughs> hey. What? That's There's no need to say that. But he was the red state guy was based off the God's yes, Hate Fags guy. Okay, but don't yeah. Okay, they they shouldn't say that. You shouldn't say it. Nobody say that word. It's ugly. Okay, fine. Uh Michael Parks <laughs> was really good in the movie. He had he delivers a lot of the of the comedy in the film through his yes, performance he does. because the stuff that he does is and has to say just is so ludicrous that it's hilarious. And he says it in such a way that you at once completely believe that he's earnest about this, and also that he is batshit insane. And But it's too... It's creepy. He actually delivers some of the creepiness because he thinks it's funny. Like, there's a scene where Justin Long wakes up after he's been drugged, and the first thing that he does to this guy is chop off his fucking leg. Cause. And there's a great foreshadowing in the movie because uh, Justin Long is going to see the Kill Bill kid, who's a kid who lost his leg playing with a samurai, samurai sword. sword. Yeah, that's the joke. And then Justin Long has a moment where he's like, who needs two legs anyway? I'm not running marathons here. <laughs> and that comes back to bite him in his butt. Yes, quite Horror literally. movie-wise. So there's a stat scene where he first wakes up and he discovers his leg is missing. And the whole time... Michael Park's character is restraining himself from giggling with because uh, he he's lying to this kid and he knows he's never going to let him go and it really adds a sense of uh, just it's scary it would be very scary to me I mean a serial killer in general is already scary but imagine if your serial killer was like giggling at you as you were like what's going on they're like hee 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 I don't know I'm gonna fucking skin you and make yeah. you a lamp like you know that's, that's a, something really fucking creepy he has a great line delivery at the end of the scene where he's just like I'm sorry for your loss I'm sorry for your loss it's 
like, oh my god. That was actually a scene where I was kind of like uncomfortable because I'm like, this guy's really fucking, he's gonna mess this guy up. Like, it's bad. But, um, yeah, Michael Parks was just excellent. It's, there's no, he's so natural at, at this character, at this character work. Like, he just embodies his characters and I don't know how he fucking just decides to just do this. Like, all of a sudden he's like, I'm gonna be fucking awesome and batch it. And then later he has a scene with Johnny Depp as Gila Point, where he is like hiding the fact that he is who he is. So he puts on this like fake voice, and He's his like perf- needs. and his performance is like so believable, so amazing, and really just creepy and weird, and really like I think his scene with Johnny Depp work the best out of any of the scenes in the movie um because they they both he grounded Johnny Depp's performance was like cartoonish in other scenes but in that scene it felt grounded against Park's performance exactly and and that scene's another one of those great eerie moments because you know that Parks is trying to get him inside the house to kill him and like and so then that moment where Gila Point goes, the guy was in the house right then and there, and I could have saved him. It's like, no, you actually couldn't because this, you could have become a warrior. This warrant, guy Gila Point. really wanted you to get inside the house so he could knock you over the fucking head and kill you. Like this guy's prepared for these moments, and you're one guy. That's another thing too. You're one guy wandering around again. Why are cops in movies always by themselves? I don't know a single motherfucking police officer. P- police officers, please tweet us at Vundablog and tell us do you ever go anywhere by your fucking selves? Are you a lone wolf? Are you a lone wolf? Is this is this Ronin police officer thing a real thing? Because every fucking time I see these in the movie there's always one police guy and that's why he gets fucked up and it doesn't seem like a very smart plan to me. I don't think that's an actual police protocol. I think you gotta go somewhere with at least another person even if you're it's just It's just going- that usually in these cases the cop is like trying to solve the no case one believes him. by himself and he does no one likes his theory he's got to chase it down by himself you know I what mean, I mean come on guys cops tell us the truth or do better like can we i don't know i mean it, are we just it, help me out cuz i'm really baffled by this thing but i mean at least it works in this movie because this whole movie is kind of based in silliness anyway so the idea of lone quebec guillepont wandering around the backwoods trying to find somebody makes sense but you know and let's discuss Guy Lapointe as a character okay so Johnny Depp now Guy Lapointe is one of like the biggest I guess you would call it trolls of the movie yes in that he shows up half more than a little more than halfway through the movie uh basically takes over the movie and becomes and changes the entire the, he- the course yeah. of the movie and becomes for most of the hero that the movie needs. Guy Lapointe is based on an awesome Smodco podcast where Guy Lapointe stopped a, a this real inspector named Guy Lapointe. Mm-hmm. He stopped a Canadian maple syrup theft ring that was going on. Oh, this is that story you were talking yeah, about? Yeah, about the, the, Canadian, the maple syrup reserve. <laughs> Guy Lapointe, the one that stopped this Maple Zero Preserve <laughs> bank robbery. I don't know which episode of Smodcast it is. You can Maple figure it out. Maple syrup's no fucking joke in Canada. In Canada, that's the basis of our economy. Maple syrup's worth a lot of money, though. That's that's the thing, is that, you know, we laugh because, you know, fucking maple syrup, because it's just so frivolous to us, but it's really worth a lot of money. If you ever tried to buy pure maple syrup in the grocery store, you get a little sticker shock at how expensive yeah. it is to tap a fucking tree and... <laughs> put it in a bucket and sell it I mean it's a lot of money um it, 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 uh, yeah I kind of find it interesting that, that that is to the point where it's such so much money that they gotta they gotta so, they have a theft ring for it they got the economy is important for it so based on that Gila Point is supposed to be the most Canadian thing ever he's from Quebec which you don't get much more Canadian than Quebec Quebec is you know, I'm not. I was only born in Canada, like by circumstance. I'm not really like I wasn't raised in Canada, but since I'm the only one here with a Canadian passport, I get to talk. <laughs> about this, so fuck off! I don't care. Uh, just like my mom was born in Scot- Scotland by circumstance, so she gets to wear a fucking kilt if she ever. Like <laughs> it. It's like, but um, no. I mean, yeah. Like, but from my, you know, I had 
teachers in school who were Canadian and raised Canadian talked about it. Quebec is a strange place, but Quebec is pretty much the most Canadian thing you can imagine just because there is no other place like Quebec. Quebec is Quebec has a lot of things. I actually also had a Facebook friend from Canada who lived in Quebec. In Quebec, they all speak French in school. You have to learn French. If you don't learn French, you're fucked. So, like, in a country full of English speakers, there's this... I mean, in a, yeah, in a, it, there's this one part of it, one province, where it's just like, mm-hmm. you speak fucking French now. Remember your Canadian history. And you don't speak French French. You speak Quebecois, which is, like, a whole other thing. I've heard it's more nasal. Um, and, I mean, yeah, the, the, the idea of a Quebec detective and this idea of of Quebec is it's it, it is interesting because they are their own people they're in very individual they stand out they are yeah <laughs> so Johnny Depp's performance in the movie um he for years now it's felt like Johnny Depp has played Jack Sparrow over and over Jack again. Sparrow over and over and that's who he is now in his old age that was his midlife crisis but thankfully Although there is a sort of Jack Sparrowiness to, there's just a, a an over the topness. I don't think it's necessarily Jack Sparrowiness. It's just that now, it's like he doesn't. He's got two modes. You know what I mean? He's either playing the straight guy, right? Which obviously for like Transcendence didn't work out very well for him because it was kind of bland and nobody really saw that movie. Or he's playing these, including over- us. <laughs> or he's playing these over the top characters um, where he loses his set himself so he doesn't want to be Johnny Depp he wants to be Key Laplante or he wants to be Jack Sparrow um, which is cool he's not going to be the type of actor that just rests on being and he's, himself he's never really been that guy ever you know it's just it has gotten kind of t- it, it's funny but by by being a subversive element and such a mainstream thing as a Disney movie right he became a caricature of his own character because it th- what Disney see and that see some could argue that's the evil of Disney right because when he made Jack Sparrow Disney did not like it the producers were like oh my god is he gay what's happening here why is he walking funny uh-huh. what the hell and he had to literally go you either fire me or let me do what I want because that's pretty much the only way you're gonna get this movie done. And so they said, okay, fine, and they let him do it. Well, guess what? After it made all this money, Disney did what any good appropriator does. It said, now you're ours. Now you keep being that fucking guy over and over and over. So again. much so that so if you go so to Hollywood you- Studios, there's a Johnny Depp show. Where you talk to Jack Sparrow Magic and w- no one. It's by the Pirates of the Caribbean. No, I'm talking about the Pirates of the Caribbean thing they have in Hollywood Studios. Oh with the giant yeah, yeah, skull, yeah, with the giant skull, the Pirates and then of the Caribbean Depp's Oh my god, three D walks that. out. Yeah, yeah, exactly. He literally is now Disney property. Jack Sparrow is Disney property. And so what ended up happening to to Johnny Depp is he got hold into this. Maybe they they just they made him play it so often that he it took him a while to kind of emerge out of it because it just kind of, Alice in Wonderland the Mad Hatter was Jack Sparrow with orange hair. You know what I mean? And then what was the other one that he did? I can't remember. It was something Charlie like, and the Chocolate Factory. No, that was before. Wasn't that before Jack Sparrow? I want to say that was in between. In between Jack Sparrow. In between World, uh, D- Dead Man's Chest and Black Pearl. Mm. I but I may be wrong. I'm a fan of Johnny Depp. You're a fan of Johnny Depp. I am a fan of Johnny Depp. He's delivered some classic films to us. He was the Edward of Edward Scissorhands. Obviously, he didn't start. He's in Ed Wood. There's nothing subtle about his performance in Ed Wood. Um, but I mean, but that worked for the for what? But it, it works for the movie. In this movie, I feel like uh, it's. Uh, I have another example when he did. Uh, even though I actually really loved, um, when he did uh, Sweeney Todd, it's he still had a Jack Sparrow accent. Yeah. Yeah, he did. So it was a little Jack well. Sparrowy. Singing Jack Sparrow. Uh, Charlie and the Chocolate Factory was. Right, yeah, it was a couple years after 
goes to the Black Pearl. Damn, I know my Johnny Depp. You do know your Johnny Depp. And that's the thing is that it just you know what it is too. I'm looking at his career. I'm looking at his the movies he's done, and he does a lot of different stuff. I've always liked Johnny Depp. He's a lot of different stuff. It's just I think that his more mainstream stuff in the last few years has always kind of felt like a Johnny, like a Jack Sparrow rehash. But if you're looking at his career, I actually do see a lot of different things here. But even you know, it's always felt like he has to be sort of. It, it started to become sticky. And maybe that's not the fault of Johnny Depp. Maybe it's the fault of the movies that he picked to do, like The Lone Ranger, which is inherently sticky. You know what I mean? Perhaps. But anyway, Gila Pond. Another sticky, schlocky kind of thing, but done in a way that I think could work as long as it doesn't become overly used. I feel like, like his opening monologue could have been rewritten or cut down mm-hmm. to be, instead of like a 10 minute piece, to be like a seven or five minute piece I think that would have helped with the pacing of the movie mm-hmm. I think that's in the, the first half of the movie is paced perfectly and then yes. the second half kind of start loses once it once you get to the monologue once you get the to monologue, the monologue yeah. literally divides the pacing of the film from one side to the next and it, and it and it changes the tone of the film and I know that there are movies that do that, and they can do them successfully, but it just, I don't know, yeah, it, it started to become sort of like, that's, I giggled more in the second half of the movie than I did in the first half. I giggled more about everything that was happening, about the characters and how they were doing, you know, how they were trying to find Justin Long's character and all that kind of stuff like that. But, I mean, on another level, it worked, because it you also are reaching the climax of this thing like how far can this walrus situation go and it isn't it's inherent once again the whole concept is inherently silly so you're always going to get to this kind of zero sum point where you're going to be giggling a little bit because it's a guy it's dressed up as a walrus <laughs> moving on uh Haley joel osmond plays a podcaster he doesn't have a lot to do in the movie except for like worrying and laughing a lot um the podcast scenes in the movie, I feel like they, for someone who does so many podcasts, he could have written, like, a lengthier podcast scene that know? was a little more... But, I mean, we all know what a podcast is. We don't need a lengthy podcast scene. That I just expe- there... I just expected, like, a five-minute scene of them podcasting. <laughs> like, I wanted to see podcasting, like, glorified for America in like an awesome way in like a really memorable scene and all I got was like snippets of podcasting well cause my thing is is that honestly is it just sort of looked like radio program <laughs> to me you know I mean that's what it is it's not that glorious it's just a radio I wish it had looked more indie yeah I wish it had looked more like an independent podcast unless like they had like but at that point, they were successful. They so were successful. they have professional but, equipment. You don't think Kevin Smith... Kevin Smith has his own studio in his house. You don't think it's full of professional equipment? He's not sitting there... Yeah, but... With a microphone. I just wanted it to be like us sitting in front of a microphone. Like one microphone, sharing it. Like pimps. Well, that's... They're, they're more successful than us. They had like a hundred... He said he had six figures worth of revenue in a year in advertising. That would be nice. That would be nice. That would be nice, guys. We're open to advertising. Yeah, we really are. Please, yeah. oh my God. sell us out, please. <laughs> Jesus Christ! <laughs> Tell us, we'll we're, change our podcast to the what sellout is that, podcast. Uh, South Park uh, episode. We're trying to do nothing for the rest of our lives. It's called Go Fund Yourself. Go Fund the Yourself. Season premiere of South Park. We w- our goal is to do nothing for the rest of our lives. Please help us achieve this goal. <laughs> we would love you forever. Um, we will also help you do nothing. Justin Long carries the movie. Bombarded now we are by another dog fart. <laughs> I can't. Uh, oh my god! You got to imagine when you see like what a dog fart is like. You got to imagine what it was like for Jane Goodall with like gorillas in the mist. Was the mist just like wicked monkey farts? First of all, gorillas in the mist was Diane Fossey. Oh, I'm sorry. Jane Goodall was chimpanzees. Oh, I'm sorry. I mixed my ape. <laughs> you missed your white British women. women. <laughs> you did. You missed your white ape-loving British women. Um, 
Yeah, I can only imagine that Jane Goodall had to get used to some pretty rank smells, because chimpanzees still shit in the public. There's no toilets. So, Justin Long... I wonder if chimpanzee farts are allowed. I wonder if they laugh at their own farts. Are allowed? Oh, no, are loud. Are loud. I wonder if they, like, and they're like, ah, 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 like, laughing at their farts. I wonder if she had to get used to that. Because that's the thing, too, is that whenever you see Jane Goodall... I'm going to digress. We can bring this back to Tusk if you want, because I bet you Jane Goodall dressed in a monkey suit one day. Anyway, whenever you see Jane Goodall, she's always so soft-spoken and intelligent, and she's talking about the beauty of these wondrous animals, right? But you never see her with the chimpanzees when they're doing what they really do, which is jacking off with frogs, eating their babies, shitting everywhere and throwing it at people. Like, these are things that we know for a fact chimpanzees do. You never see her talking about that shit. Maybe that's the part that she hides, that she's that's... really into it. She's into, like, the shiza of it. <laughs> so throw that poop in my face. <laughs> Oh, Jane got lost in the woods again for a couple of weeks. She comes out. It's covered in musk and <laughs> spray. It's like, Jane, I think you need to shower. No, I'm letting it stew in my body. Did she ever let a trim? No, well, let's not go into that. <laughs> so, Justin Long. <laughs> he, he carries the movie. Do you think Jane Goodall? Whatever. Whatever would I sign? <laughs> Free room and board. Just you gotta dress up as a chimp. <laughs> that <way. laughs> that's the next. That's the that's the sequel to Tusk. That, that Tusk was... to the chimp, the chimpanzee, the revenge. Chimp. I'm trying to call chimp. A... Chimp. <laughs> Pansy. <laughs> Pansy, the untold Jane Goodall story. So Justin Long <laughs> stars in the movie. I'm trying to bring this back to Justin Long. Yeah, because I'm going through the actors oh, okay. that are acting. Uh, he, I think he does a great job. He has to play uh, an asshole. Yes. Which is good for us as the audience because we feel less remorse when he's put into a walrus suit, even though you feel, you know, as bad as you could for. A guy who... Is kind of a dick. Who's kind of a dick. Which I kind of, you know, I wanted to... And that's a deliberate choice. To make him kind of a douchebag so we don't really feel pity for him as much. So we're more enjoying this moment of him becoming a walrus. Because we're like, yeah, you kind of deserve this motherfucker. If it was Mother... It's just that if it was Mother Teresa getting turned into a walrus... We'd be like, ah! We would lose faith in God and humanity. But if it's just like some asshole guy with a horrible mustache, then you feel a lot better. Yeah. I, it, I mean, it's... Yeah. I kind of I kind of thought that was interesting, too. The They touched on it very briefly. The idea of these, like, modern day age, where we are trolling, this, this constant trolling. You know what I mean? Because the walrus thing was a joke. You know? No one's making anybody dress up as a walrus. But the show on the movie... Justin Long's character, they film... First of all, they call themselves the Nazi Party. Nazi spelled N-O-T-S-E-E Party. Which, you know, okay. Actually, that then, reminds me of something. And I'm going to interrupt you for a second. Yeah, okay. We need a good podcast, like, end goodbye phrase. Because that's what all the successful podcasts have. Nerdist has, like, enjoy your burrito. And uh, Kevin Smith says have a week on Smodcast. And uh, the Nazi party in this movie has please join the Nazi party. So we need to come up with a good end podcast name. Yeah, you think that's why we're not, we're not successfully on my love? That's why only six people. Yeah, we'll be in the years. six digits. Six digits? We'll be in the six figures once we have a good quote to end our podcast with. Whoa, Justin Long's dating Amanda Seyfried. Good for you, Justin Long. Um. <laughs> <laughs> Gossip <Zossip> news! <laughs> Side note, just reading his Wikipedia page. Gossip news on the Wundercast. Um, no, so, but, well, to get back to what, you're right, I agree, we need a good send-off, but to get back to what I was saying before I was interrupted with that random thought. Sorry. Um, I think that he touched on it a little bit, this idea that we're so, you know, at this point, we revel in people suffering a little bit too much sometimes for ratings. 
you know, especially on the internet. Uh-huh. And it kind of seemed like the, the the sum of his bad choices because that was what everybody said. He, they said, don't go to Canada and make fun of this guy. It's messed That's too up. Far. It's too much. It's messed up. It's messed up enough to make fun of him on your show for cutting his fucking leg off. You know, and it, it, and so it kind of seemed like this sort of. Huh, I wish I had a better literary explanation for this because I'm sure it exists. I just can't think of it off the top of my head. But it's like, it's it's his comeuppance. It's his it's his karma. You know, yeah. he went too far, and then going the distance took him quite literally over to the edge of animalism sort of like this dog eat dog idea like that's what his whole concept was he did not care that this kid had suffered he wanted to just get this guy because he knew it would be good for his ratings so that's kind of a dog eat dog sort of idea this you know when we talk about the dog eat dog world we think about it nowadays in terms of business we'll fuck people over and do nasty shit so that we can get a good review or a good uh-huh. butt bit of publicity and so if you want to follow that train of thought to its conclusion uh, with using the movie, you could kind of see how him becoming a walrus and becoming this animal at the end, going full walrus, as Kevin Smith says, um, is sort of him just falling into the base animal instincts that he had at the beginning, which was, fuck everyone else over, I gotta get mine, you know? Yeah, I could see that. I didn't see that before. Oh. Whoa. Whoa. You know? I really liked Justin Long. I was impressed by him in the movie. Yeah. Um, I liked... I thought his acting through the... Through the makeup effects was... You know, worked really well and looked really believable. And he sold it and... It's a hard thing to have to not be able to talk... Yeah. Through the second half of a movie. Mm Mm-hmm. And have to carry a performance on just your eyes and your grunts and screams. Uh, so, big. This was his castaway. I think, yeah, I think just. But, but just, that's the thing. Justin Long, I think he's one of those actors that he's never. He, he does. You know, people know who he is. I don't know if he's a household name, but people know who he is. They know he's the Mac guy. Big, if you say Mac yeah, guy. Yeah, but, I mean, but that's not about. really household name. That's, you know. But, like, you know, I, I, he's one of those guys where he. Does, he's done all kinds of stuff. He's really gone all over the place and kind of had a very varied career. And and I think that he's really good at what he does. And I think that he's consistently good. I think that, you know, he can play geeky and nerdy. He can play a different kind of character. He can... He can I don't know. I just... I, I always... I like Justin Long. There's something about his character and, and he's funny. And that's the thing, too, is I think... Kevin Smith, to me, actually really knows what to do with Justin Long because every time I've seen Justin Long in a Kevin Smith piece, he's been really different and interesting and doing something that I've never seen him do before. Like, who knew how funny Justin Long could be until you saw Zack and Mary and he's yeah, playing he's the gay porn star. I mean, he's the best part of that movie. You Hands know, down. He really is. He's the best part he of He steals movie. it with, like, one scene. He does. And and it's it's so good. And you did never thought that that could be Justin Long. You know what I mean? And I, I love that, yeah. Apparently, him and Kevin Smith have talked about maybe spinning that character off. I would die to see a Randy... <laughs> what was his name? Randy St. James? I think his James? name was Randy St. James. Yeah, yeah, I would die to see a Randy St. James spinoff film. I would, <laughs> like, that would make my life. Even if... It was a short film. If it was 30 minutes long, I don't care. I would want a Randy St. James. I never got sick of him. He was the best part of it. Fuck Wars, yes. Randy St. James, yes. Randy St. James, yes. Uh, that's, that's pretty much the whole cast. Your mother with her pills and her drink. <laughs> so not picky, but... One thing I really dug about this movie was I love when Kevin Smith is really flexing his independent film muscles. And this really felt like Mm -hmm. a totally unique film that's not going to be made in any Hollywood system. Yep. And I commend it for that, for feeling so independent. Well, I do. And I commend it for being... Yeah, I really do. I commend it for being independent without being pretentious. Because a lot of times when things are trying really hard to be indie, 
they're so obnoxiously pretentious that you're like, Ugh, you know, like I can't with you. But it didn't feel like that. It felt funny and fresh and 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 irreverent and independent at the same time. And overall, I like the structure of the film that it kind of comes at you in a way that it's like it starts off being, you know, sort of uh, it's comedic, it's light, it gets darker in tone, it gets creepy, and then it gets fun, and then it gets creepy, and then it gets fun, and then it ends on a laugh. It ends on a very silly note. You can't take that ending seriously. The ending we're talking about is the Easter egg at the end with uh, no, and I'm talking Johnny about... Depp. Yeah. Uh, complaining that he ate too many Gimli sliders. I'm also I'm also saying the ending itself where she goes to help him at the exotic animal sanctuary. You think that was funny? Yes! And she's crying. It's sad. She, it's so funny. Steven, that's funny. It's sad that he's alone. That they should have put him out of his misery. They really should have killed him. And killed him. And, and it... It just raises so many questions for me. His anatomy. How does he poop? Where did the poop they, come out? He had to have Where does sewed, the pee comes out? He had to have sewed the rectum and, like, the penis into, like, the upper part of the skin. But the skin... So that but the could, walrus the skin is fatter than he was. So what's it filled with? Other flesh? Wouldn't that rot? You understand there's logistics here. I feel that this suit was not meant Over to... a year, it would rot the I face feel that, pieces. Yes. I, this the skin, grafting. This, the, unless it's... It looked like fresh skin to me. So unless he grafted it in such a way that he connected the blood vessels so that they would work, he'd eventually become a nasty, necrotic piece of rotty death. Like, you know what I mean? That's why I'm sitting there going, they should have put him out of his misery. Because he's really not going to last like this. Man was not meant to be walrus. But it's a fairy tale at the end of it. It's it, sort of like a dark fairy tale. It is a dark fairy tale. My one beef with the movie... The whole thing is a dark fairy tale, really. My one beef with the movie, when I look at it next to Red State, mm -hmm. is that Red State and Tusk both sort of hinge on the same plot device. That there's somebody out there doing bad who's set a trap in the form of like an, an, uh, a message online mm -hmm. or a message on a wall and is pulling someone into mm -hmm. a horrible situation. You bait and bait and the hook, the fish. Yeah. I think that, you know, there, there are other ways to skin a horror cat than to uh, just, you know, thought, reel someone in. I thought that he was going to meet him at the bar. That's how I thought this movie was going to go. Yeah. I thought that the whole point was that he was going to talk to him at the bar, he was going to get him drunk, and then get him back to his house, and then walrus him up. I didn't realize that he was going to like actively seek this fucking guy out. Yeah, because in these movies, you have to put yourself into... You have to be responsible for your own... Demise. Demise. Yeah. Uh, well, when we went to go see it, I went to go see it twice, and both times to was to a theater of about six people, five six people, which was you know I had dreamed that I would walk in there and I'd see all these other Smodcast fans, and we would like be like yeah I was in Smodcast too and high fives and stuff, and we'd all be laughing together and unfortunately although they may have been Smodcast fans they did not. Steven has a romantic appear. view of the universe. Damn it. Damn it. How dare I? No, there's something wrong with your romantic view. I I mean, but that's the thing, is that it sort of exposes exactly how many Smod... There are a lot of Smodcast fans out there, but how many of them are there? If you spread... I actually think that this, this release was spread a little thin. 600 theaters is a lot. But I mean, I guess they tried to get it out to as many states as possible. The thing is, is that there's like millions of people listening to Smodcast, but a lot of those millions of people are also like international. Yeah. They're in the UK, they're in Australia, well, they haven't been released Well, it's going to come out yet. internationally, yeah, right? So, that's the thing, is that right now, it's a box office bleh, in America, which is happening a lot. But maybe it'll do really well overseas. Maybe. And Americans just suck. Maybe we're just not willing to take risks. What if Wars that... Fever overtakes the UK and Australia? Yeah, And maybe. everybody starts risking up as Wars's? 
skinned walruses. The hottest Halloween costume. Everyone must go full walrus. <laughs> you go full walrus. Where do you stick the tusk? <laughs> uh, mm, it's not that's not for radio yet. Um, no, my thing. Yeah, I don't know. Sometimes I feel like American audiences kind of suck now. I feel like we take a lot less risks. Um, I followed a lot of the Twitter responses, both on Warus Yes and Warus No hashtags. Mm-hmm. And there was about, like, 20 or so Warus No's now, like a week later. And there are hundreds of Warus Yeses. That's good. So the people that found this movie mostly had a positive experience with it, which Cause if you go is special. In, yeah, if you go in and you get it. I think that it really is. It's a, it's a, it's a nice experience. Um, it's fun and it's funny, and I think that that is it's nice to see people being supportive because you know a lot of times when people don't like something they tend to be the most vocal about it. But I think a lot of people have been very positive about this movie, which makes Kevin Smith very happy, which is nice. Uh, big props have to go out to the man behind the war suit, Robert Kurtzman. Um, I love the fact that there are, like, faces and ears mm-hmm. sewn onto the walrus body. And I love the way the the tusks look as they come out of his face. It looks so gnarly. Yeah. Um, I appreciated, you know, as we said before, the lack of torture porniness and gore. I do. I did appreciate that because that's what I was really afraid it was going to be. I thought it was going to be really torture porny. Yeah. But they they stuck to more like the the mental idea of how fucked up it is to be a walrus <laughs> for another human being, and I really I thought like the, one of the best images that we both agreed on was when they're trying to when Michael Parks is trying to teach his walrus to swim and it goes down and you see another dead walrus another human to, yeah. walrus that was created and you see like a skull with the tusks in it. And that looks super gnarly, super cool. So. That was one of the really creepy moments of the film, too. So that's why like, I think that this really showed that Kevin Smith has an ability to create something genuinely scary. Because that was a really t- scary moment to know. for this. It's And it's scary because for the character, now he, not only does he know how... Like, he knew he was fucked, but now he needs to know just how fucked he was. That this guy's already tried this and it didn't work out. Yeah. And he's just going to keep doing it. You know what I mean? Like, this is just a never-ending journey for this motherfucking crazy person. And I love how the movie leaves you with, like, you really don't know if anything Michael Park's character, Howard Howe, says to be true. Yeah. You have no idea. You have no idea if he actually ever really... If he even met a walrus. Met a walrus, if he ever really knew Ernest Hemingway. Like, everything could be total bullshit. This guy could have this delusional fantasy land, you know, like like life in his head, and he just centered all around walruses for some fucking reason, and it lends sort of this creepiness to it, really. Yeah. This the, it lends a it lends something more than just oh look at this goofy movie about turning a guy into a walrus. Like it's kind of like. Michael Park's character is, is really a scary guy. He's disturbed, and he's unreliable, and just, you know, but yet so menacing, and so finds a way to isolate this guy so completely. You know, just the simple act of drugging him and cutting off his leg. Like, that totally... That's the thing, too, is that that was so amazing, because it really took him out of immediately out of the game. You know, like, a lot of times in horror movies, they give the characters kind of a fighting chance before they're like, no, nope, uh-huh. you're done. But, like, this guy it was, no, from the minute. Drugged up, barely able to walk. Yes, yeah, sedated horrible, the entire sedated time. Sedated the entire time. Like, there is no escape for you, dude. Like, you, there's no crawling out of here. Um. So, we love Tusk over at the Vunda blog and the Vunda cast. We recommend you go support Tusk in whatever way you can. Yes. Uh, because people need money and stuff. So that's good. I'm going to be there for Yoga Hosers and Moose Jaws. Definitely. The next two uh, horror films out of Kevin Smith's pipe. See what I did there? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Very <laughs> clever. 
Uh, even though he doesn't smoke pipes, he smokes joints. So that was a stretch. I digress. I just like you all to know that Samuel L. Jackson live tweets football games. You mean That's soccer it. football games, or real football games? No football games, like an actual football game. That's pretty cool. Yeah. D needs to rise the fuck up. I don't know why I'm looking at Samuel L. Jackson's Twitter. I'm just, you know, I'm just letting you know. So that's Sam not, Jackson, if you have our, any thoughts, that's not our send off. What's Sam Jackson's Twitter? Samuel L. Jackson. <laughs> he got <laughs> a good Samuel Twitter handle. He got a good Twitter handle. I gotta say, <laughs> very accurate. And the picture of him is very menacing. It's like, what the fuck? So tweet us at Vundacast at Samuel L. Jackson if you agree with what we are saying. Try to get Samuel L. Jackson to get Walrus. Yes. Whoa, that would be crazy. Whoa, that'd be pretty cool. He wouldn't fit. Would he? Could he play Canadian? Uh, who cares? Could, could he play Canadian? Would we just put him in like a leaf maple leaf shirt? <laughs> <laughs> I'm Canadian. I'm Samuel L. Jackson, and I'm a Canadian. This is motherfucking hockey. <laughs> uh, this has been the motherfucking Vundercast. Did we? I did. We didn't introduce ourselves this week. I have been Steven. and I have been Danielle. And <laughs> I'm thinking of a cool, clever way to end this episode. Did we miss anything? I feel like we missed something. I, I have a send off for us, and it is a tweet by at Dylan Sococcio. We can keep trying these out until we find one that sticks. Dylan Sococcio says Sorcerers use illusion and manipulation to create opposition within the self and through the world. Wake up to this. What's his Twitter? Dylan Sococcio. S A C C O C C I O. Dylan Sococcio, you're on the motherfucking Bundacast. <laughs> Wundercast? Give yeah. it up for Wundercast, man. What an adorable name. Yeah.